Okay, well, we've got a good amount of people here already, and it's 9.32. Um, I know more people will be coming in, but I'm going to start to um, get us going. So good morning, everyone. Welcome to our HIV Center rounds. Um, this will be our last round before the, the new year. Um, so thanks for being here. And um, anyone can um, make an announcement if they want, just raise your hand and um, let us know that you'd like to make an announcement. I'm going to let you know about our next rounds in the new year. Our first rounds in the new year will be one of our uh, postdoctoral uh, fellows, alumni rounds, and that will be on January 12th. We have Alyssa Davis uh, talking about what about us engaging adolescents and young adults in Kazakhstan to develop a digital HIV stigma, re stigma reduction intervention using crowdsourcing. And then the second person that day will be Zoe Edelstein using research and evaluation to inform HIV prevention program and policy examples from the New York City Health Department. And then I'll, um, the second grand rounds will be on January 26. And we have a special dear friend and colleague who is the director of the um, UCLA HIV Center. Um, and it's Steve Shoptaw and with our colleague from here, Jeremy Kidd, talking about integrated strategies when addressing meth and phetamine use among men who have sex with men living with HIV or with HIV risks. And then in the middle of the month, on January 17th, another round, we have a virtual interactive seminar. It's on January 17th. Edward Meach will be talking about coincidence analysis, a new method for addressing complexity and context in implementation research. So those are three special events, uh, two rounds and one seminar in January in the new year. Okay, so today we have our special double billing. And first up, I'll introduce them one at a time because we'll have time for a little bit of Q&A in between the presentations. Um, so first up today is Dr. Sarah Wood, who is an assistant professor of pediatrics at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She's a clinician investigator in adolescent medicine and HIV specialist with a career focus on reducing the incidence of HIV and sexually transmitted infections among adolescents and young adults. Over the past decade, uh, she has led clinical research exploring the structural and healthcare associated determinants of HIV prevention behavior in adolescents and young adults and the use of implementation science to improve the integration of sexual health preventive services into primary care for adolescents, a topic very dear to many of our hearts. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Sarah, and a reminder to everyone to um, stay muted during the presentation. There will be time for Q&A and discussion immediately afterwards that will be moderated by my colleague, Stephen Sukumari. So over to you, Sarah, welcome, thanks for being here. So over to you, Sarah, welcome, thanks so, for being over here. Over to you, Sarah. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, I'm just pulling up my slides now. Um, and let me go ahead and start. So I'm gonna be talking today about implementing adolescent HIV services during the COVID pandemic. And, um, can people hear me okay as I'm talking? I know I have a little bit of a lag here. There is Just a little bit of a lag, a little bit broken up, but we are hearing you. And, okay, um, I'm gonna switch mics and we'll go from there. How about, How about now? Not any better? better? It's, it's got an echo. I'll let Stephen um, um, work with you on this. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit of an echo. Can you uh, turn off one of your mics? Yep. 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 Even any better now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. And let me get my slides up. All 
All right, and here we go, everybody. So thanks for so much for your patience. Um, and I was gonna talk about implementing equitable adolescent HIV prevention services during COVID as the baseline, the bad and the better, but I'm actually gonna talk about the good, the bad and the better. Um, and let me get rid of one version of myself over here as I talk. Um, because I think it's really important for us to think about where we're going um, when we think about where we're going to think about where we're coming from as well. So I have no COIs and by way of learning objectives, my goal is for us to recognize the challenges to equitable delivery of HIV testing for teens prior to COVID, to understand how the pandemic impacted delivery and innovation, and to highlight the use of implementation science methods to address um, basically precision implementation and development of interventions to address key barriers to equity. So my mission statement is really to identify gaps in quality HIV prevention service delivery for teens using multi-level health system data. And when I talk about quality, I'm talking about these six institution, uh, institute of uh, medicine dimensions of healthcare quality with a specific focus on equity. From there, I use those data to develop and test innovative strategies to advance quality HIV prevention services using approaches from implementation science and human systems engineering. And that's really what I'm gonna focus on today. So where do I live? I like to start with this because to orient people, um, most of my research happens within a large primary care network. Um, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, we actually have one of the largest networks in the country. We have 31 clinics over two states that serve over 250,000 patients, about a quarter of whom are Black or African American, and about 33% have public insurance. We also have two embedded Title X family planning clinics that provide free and confidential care. And I focus on primary care because the patients who come in to see me in my clinics, which is the HIV clinic and PrEP clinic, are really the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of adolescents in the United States are gonna get any sexual health services they get from their pediatrician. So let's talk about this um, baseline. How was equity looking heading into COVID? Well, as many of you know, we have strong adolescent guidelines for screening that emphasize universa universality from AAP, CDC, and USPSTF. We should screen everyone for HIV, sexually active females, plus or minus males, for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Everyone who has an, HI, uh, an STI should be screened again for HIV. And everyone should be aware of PrEP, with PrEP offered to those who are interested or who have HIV vulnerabilities. Um, however, we see that HIV and STIs are not distributed equally in the population. We see that most new infections happen in sexual and gender minoritized individuals and individuals who are um, Black or Latinx. And that's not due to individual behavior. This is largely due to structural effects. In fact, when we look at the proportion of US high school students who have ever had sex, I want us to recognize that between males, females, and across racial and ethnic groups, this is from the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance Survey, differences in sexual activity are marginal. So we really, when we apply a screening guideline rubric, we should be screening equally across those groups. Even if we see a higher proportion of infection in certain groups, everyone should be getting screened. However, we're really not doing that. Only about 8% of US high school students have had an HIV test. And through the sort of multi-level modeling in my lab, we found that only 55% of youth with STIs get an HIV test within 30 days of diagnosis. And that patients who are female sex at birth are much less likely than males to be tested that providers um, show implicit bias in how they screen for STIs. So another study we finished last year showed that providers were 88% more likely to screen their own black versus their own white female patients for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And one of my postdoctoral level uh, fellows, Debbie Watson, showed that in our network, only 8% of teens with what we would think of as qualifying STIs received PrEP counseling. And um, if you just take a look at those massive odds ratios and confidence intervals, you can see that we are really exclusively offering PrEP to individuals who are male sex at birth or who identify as sexual or gender minoritized individuals. 
So in the pre-COVID period, the big takeaways that we saw were, we're not screening equitably. Biases drive these inequities. But overall, we're really just under screening everyone. And so as someone who's been very interested in PrEP, one of the key takeaways for me is that we just cannot even get to equitable PrEP delivery until we address quality and equity in HIV screening. From there, my interest really fell onto clinical decision support. So this is um, basically draws on human systems engineering and behavioral economics approach to try to get the right information to the right person at the right time in the right place. So this schematic kind of shows what busy primary care providers are dealing with. They get too much information in the visit, both from the patient, but from the electronic health record. But that information down in this green quarter doesn't give us enough meaning. So for instance, we may get a ton of information in the patient chart, but it might not pull out that that teen's never had an HIV test or that they have gonorrhea and they need to be screened again. All of this is happening under tremendous time pressure, um, which means you need to act fast. And patients, uh, sorry, clinicians switch into heuristic thinking that leads to biased decision making. In fact, there's a lot of data that shows as our cognitive demands increase, our uh, implicit bias, our race-based implicit bias actually increases. So um, clinicians are more likely at the end of a busy shift to make decisions that are biased than at the beginning of the shift. So CDS is really a set of knowledge-driven interventions that can provide, promote improved quality of care. So we can think about this as our nudges in the electronic health record or making sure that information is filtered the way that we need it to decrease mental workload, increase situational awareness, improve provider self-efficacy to do the right thing, override bias, standardized evidence-based care, and streamline work flows. So right before the pandemic, I took a deep dive on this and did an interview study with 26 clinicians, getting their perspectives on using clinical decision support to improve HIV screening, and really based the script and the domains on the consolidated framework for implementation research. Um, so if you're not familiar with CIFR, it's basically a determinants framework for implementation science that considers five factors um, that can be associated with successful implementation. Um, for the CIFR nerds in the group, we eliminated the process domain um, in the data that I'm going to show. And that was because this was really pre-implementation research. So when we asked providers what characteristics they wanted from an intervention, they mentioned that they wanted something to be standardized to promote that intervention, that universal screening, but they wanted nudges to be adaptable to the patient needs. So you might get one nudge that's kind of broad for the teen who's never had an HIV test, but a stronger nudge for the teen with gonorrhea or chlamydia, and that this needed to be at the right time in the workflow and usable that in terms of their own characteristics, they needed more information about HIV testing and PrEP. Many did not feel like they had sufficient knowledge. They didn't feel like they had self-efficacy in talking to teens about sex or getting a sexual history. And they recognized that high mental workload led to implicit bias. Most felt like they would know to screen a young gay man who came in, but might, might not think to screen a cis female with gonorrhea. Within the inner setting of the clinics, they felt that resources needed to be able to act when they made the decision. So having the lab, having the test available, that the structure of staffing needed to change to make that easier, and that they needed to have a clinic culture that really placed an emphasis on innovation and on HIV as an important issue. They also said, we're not gonna get anything done until we recognize the, the um, impact of having parents in the room and those threats to confidentiality. We pulled out patient needs separately, and really they focused on that patients often didn't think about HIV um, as applied to themselves, and that they thought about HIV in highly stigmatized ways. And then in the outer setting, which are sort of the things that are happening outside of the clinic, most of that did come down to being able to protect confidentiality, um, either through insurance or laws, um, from parents finding out HIV tests, and then the larger context of structural racism, sexism, and homophobia that influenced their own thinking. So using these data, we were really ready to design a system. And then the bad happened, which was the COVID pandemic. But there's a dash of good in there that I'm going to get to too. So what happened to innovation and implementation when everything shut down? 
Well, we lost our in-person visits for months. Um, in pediatric health systems, we had to get newborns seen and we had to get vaccine visits done and COVID sick visits, which meant routine adolescent care fell off the map. We saw decreased STI and HIV testing because of that. And we were already in the hole and not screening enough, but it got worse. So we weren't getting people in for testing, which meant that people weren't treated, which meant we had more transmission. And um, with my postdoc, we modeled based on our estimated cases that um, are expected cases that we estimated about 159 missed gonorrhea and chlamydia cases in the first eight months of the pandemic. Those are also 159 missed opportunities for PrEP um, and for HIV testing. Our clinical resources and funding got diverted to COVID. We had freezes on our workflow, so we could not build any systems in the EHR. We had supply chain breakdowns, staffing shortages, which meant that it's really hard to build interventions on getting an HIV test if there's no one to do the test. And obviously massive magnification of structural uh, inequities and institutional racism were happening throughout the pandemic. But there were some good news. Several opportunities did arise during the pandemic. We had a massive and rapid scale up of telehealth. So you can see our little flyer there for video visits. And in the first 30 days of our adolescent health system switching to telehealth, we were able to conduct 400 visits. To use those visits, patients and families needed to access our patient portals. And this created an awesome opportunity to be able to send health information and communicate with patients in a far more efficient way. There were advancements in point of care testing, as well as the acceptability of self-collected specimens, which had um, significant downstream implications for ways that we could remodel HIV and STI testing. The rise of video conferencing allowed us to more nimbly create teams. And for the first time, there's nothing good about um, the structural racism and violence that um, have been so ever present. But for the first time ever, we saw real in institutional investments in thinking about health equity as one of those IMOM quality metrics. And that for the first time really translated into dollars and staff. So this leads us to the better. And that is really the piece where we're gonna talk about implementation strategies to get to equitable testing and how these have really grown out of these pandemic advances. So one of the things that happened to me that was a good during the pandemic was that I became one of the inter CIFAR implementation science scholars at Hopkins, which is a phenomenal program that I really um, suggest anyone take advantage of. Um, and I became familiar with JD Smith's implementation research logic model. Um, and so for those of you who haven't seen this, I'll kind of walk it through. It's a way to really figure out how you build the right strategies, the right tools to get the thing you need to get done. So you start with an evidence-based practice. In this case, it was HIV testing. And you wanna figure out how you're getting there. We had already sort of thought about clinical decision support. So in pink, you can see that on the top, that's where we're gonna focus. You plug in your determinant data, and we had a lot of this data. This is all coming from that slide we, I showed you before, sorry. And thinking about how clinical decision support works. We already went through this, but this is our mental workload, our situational awareness, and our standardization. And the next thing we had to think through before we thought about what we're gonna do, the strategies, was the outcomes, how we were gonna measure it, and how we were gonna bake in equity. So we used um, frameworks that already existed. This is Enola Proctor's Implementation Outcomes Framework. And in hot pink, you'll see the things that we wanted to bake an equity element in. So not only did we have to make sure our interventions were acceptable, they needed to be acceptable to patients and providers across racial, ethnic, sexuality, and sexual orientation groups. We needed to have our interventions reach our populations equally. So I can talk till the cows come home about how wonderful telehealth is, but we knew that there were massive disparities in telehealth rollout that had to do with broadband access, regionality, and a number of other factors, so that ultimately we saw lower rates of telehealth uptake in Black and Latinx individuals and in publicly insured individuals, so that reach really needed to focus on equity as well. For our service outcomes, we wanted to adhere to guidelines, but we also had to close the pre-existing equity gaps in those guidelines. 
And for our patient outcomes, we added patient centeredness from the Institute of Medicine um, definition, along with our care continuum measures, really meaning that the interventions that we delivered needed to be culturally humble. So I'm gonna spend my last few minutes talking about some of the strategies we developed. Um, and these are all grounded in the expert recommendations for implemented change or the ERIC taxonomy. So what we decided to do to get from our determinants to our mechanisms and measure these outcomes was to develop stakeholder interrelationships, adapt and tailor interventions to context, remind clinicians to screen, mandate that they screen, train and educate our stakeholders, prepare patients and parents to be active participants, change infrastructure, and test change cyclically. So what did that look like? So our first was stakeholder interrelationship. So before the pandemic, we had had a group that was um, physicians and nurse practitioners from adolescent medicine and um, primary care. But we realized quickly that that was gonna be insufficient to actually be able to create and deliver something that would work. So we pulled in an organization in our network called the Possibilities Project um, that had our innovation experts and our informaticians. We pulled in quality and patient safety services because we were able to really make the argument that HIV and STI testing need to be key quality metrics on which were graded in our network. We pulled in our HIV and PrEP clinics so we could rapidly link kids who test positive or who need PrEP. We had a youth advisory board that all of our youth facing interventions. We had to pull in our legal team to make sure that everything that we were working on fit within youth confidentiality laws. We ran all the family-facing interventions by a multilingual family research advisory council. And then the little rascals. So this is one thing I'll argue, you need to have people who are willing to take risks. And we had a group of pediatricians and nurse practitioners, they named themselves the little rascals, who were really willing to try anything to move the needle in this area. And they've been crucial to implementation. Um, this says strategy one should say strategy two, and that was adapting interventions to context. So you'll remember from those CIFR um, uh, determinants that pediatricians felt really uncomfortable talking to teens about sex and getting parents out of the room. So we developed a primary care um, based self screener for teens that they fill out before visits. Um, again, with all this device utilization and mobile health, this moved forward faster during the pandemic than we expected. Teens now fill out before every, every well visit their sexual orientation, gender identity, interest in PrEP, substance use, and their sexual history. And that sexual history metric allows us to drive the strength of our screening reminders. So we remind clinicians to screen, that was our next strategy. And the first piece of that, being able to do something that was universal, is that we added those orders to the visit sets for all teen well visits. So if you open up your note for the well visit, the orders are already there. But we wanted to drive the strength of the alert to make sure that the clinicians were getting more than that for teens who were having sex. So we took the sexual activity data from the screener and we built clinical decision support alerts. Um, and so this is our next mechanism, which is mandating change. So if you take a look at this, this is now an alert um, that pops up when you open your note, reminding that they need to screen. And I'm gonna show you a few key features here. This is in usability testing right now. So this is our prototype as of today after testing with about 15 clinicians. Clinicians wanted to default to order, so make it easier to do the right thing. So the order box is the bright blue and the do not order grabs your attention a little less. We've also mandated this. You can't get rid of the screen until you acknowledge why you're not going to test. I wanna point out that this is also a key equity consideration because in the background, we can look at this data and see not only did they screen or not screen, but did patient characteristics influence that decision to screen or not screen? And if we're seeing inequitable screening, what some of those drivers might be. We also provide relevant information by allowing them to link to previous STI and HIV results. And we, hit to, we also link to guidelines here. And this gets us to our next point, which was training and educating stakeholders. 
We created webinars, we created brief five minutes videos that you can search online, which was like everything you need to know about HIV in five minutes. Um, but we also created a clinical pathway guideline that's not just standardized to our network, it's actually available everywhere. So if you go to Google right now and type in CHOP STI pathway, um, this is screening for STIs, but it also goes over all of our HIV screening. And you can see in the light blue box in the side that you also see all of our guidelines so that providers have at their fingertips the PrEP guidelines, everything they need to do to do the right thing based on the evidence for the patients. And when we talk about training and education, it wasn't just about HIV, it also had to be bias because implicit biases are actually malleable. We all have them, but they can change. So it was mandated in our health system to do an implicit association test so you can understand what your own biases may be. Um, that's a picture on the right from the race-based IAT. And we did standardized DEI, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training across our entire division, as well as developing active bystander training for microaggressions. And then we prepared patients, sorry. The last one I'll talk about, because I know I'm running short on time, was preparing patients and parents to be active participants. So when we thought about that issue of how we get parents on board and how we get around this, we decided that we needed something that normalized for parents that HIV and STI testing was going to happen during the visit. So we created the Adolescent Welcome Letter, basically a letter that goes out to every parent and teen when they turn 13, which says, one of the things that's going to happen at your visit is routine screening for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and HIV that the provider is going to talk to your teenage teenager alone, and that we're gonna talk about vaccines, including HPV. So it no longer would feel like a gotcha to the family or that for the clinician that they were delivering a gotcha um, when they talked about these things. This is sent out over the patient portal and from an equity perspective has been translated into the key languages spoken within our network. But we also know again, reach that many people can't get on the portal. So we've been able to expand the reach of this by also putting it on our public facing website. Again, if you want to Google shop adolescent welcome letter, anyone can find it, but also including it in after visit summaries for teen visits. And we're currently working with our parent advisory council to create pre-visit text messages to parents in multiple languages that again, set this expectation that part of us helping your teen grow up into a healthy adult is doing these screenings. So I'm gonna skip this last one in the interest of time and talk about our next tests, steps. So we're hoping to deploy the CDS for cyclical tests of change, but everything else is already in practice. And I think this is one thing that we do have to talk about is thinking about measurement priorities and how you measure when you're doing a multi-implementation strategy um, bundle where different things deploy at different times. So pragmatic and timely implementation can make measurement tough. And we're hoping to use tools like interrupted time series analyses to really look at Marginal, marginal benefits for equity and outcomes after each part of this package is rolled out. We also have to be mindful that we're measuring moving the needle on equity, not just on the testing outcomes. And lastly, we haven't talked about the teen focused work, but this is actually an intervention that I'm developing that um, goes to the teen side of this to make sure that teens are educated on and aware of the menu of prevention options they have for themselves when they come in for visits. And so in conclusion, um, the main points I wanted to make today is that we can use our routine health system data to identify key health inequities that threaten the quality of HIV service delivery and use those to drive implementation. We saw that these inequities were magnified during the COVID-19 pandemic, but using tools like the IRLM or other implementation science strategies can map the right solutions onto our unique health system strategies or challenges. And remembering that when we're thinking about bias and equity, we need to not just focus on a single level, but we need to focus on the provider, the clinic, and the health system, and not just focus on individual youth behavior. Um, I wanna acknowledge my partners and my funders, and I'd love to take any questions. Thanks so much, and apologies for the technical difficulties early on. Not a problem at all, Sarah. Thank you so much. That was great um, and really important work you shared.
Um, so a reminder to everyone, uh, before we jump into the Q&A, you can either use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enter your question. I'll read it out on your behalf, or you can use the raise hand feature and I will unmute you. Um, so Sarah, we have a two-part question first. Uh, how did you address staff buy-in, particularly given the demands of their time? And was there any pushback to the mandates to screen? Yeah, I think those are, are great questions. So staff buy-in is still tough for HIV screening, and I could talk for a half hour about that alone. But um, one thing that I think we don't often think about is that most pediatric offices don't have rapid screening. So this involves getting a kid to a lab. Um, so we still are working on getting people ready to work that into their workflow. But um, one of the things we were able to do by pulling in the quality and patient safety group from the hospital was actually say chlamydia and gonorrhea screening is a HEDIS measure, which means we actually get money back to our system by screening. And so um, a piece of this that I didn't talk about is about a month ago, we rolled out provider incentives for gonorrhea and chlamydia screening. So they actually get paid better if they screen. Haven't been able to make that happen for HIV screening yet, but my sort of argument is that in primary care, most of the way that you get to HIV screening is actually through STI screening. Um, so I think that's a, a first step in the path. Um, I also think in terms of getting provider buy-in, you know, doing a lot of the education work and, you know, for lack of a better term, shaking hands and kissing babies really matters. I go out to practices all the time. And I think a lot of um, being juniors, you're, you hear a lot about when you have to say no, but I would also make an argument that there has to be, if you're doing this provider facing work, a lot of opportunities to say yes. And so pretty much every provider knows they can text me if they have a prep question, an HIV question, doesn't matter if I'm on call, I'm gonna get back to them because they have to see that they're getting something tangible out of this as well. So really having like a PR campaign about it has been critical. Great, thank you. Um, another question, developing stakeholder relationships seems to be a really important strategy. Can you please talk a little about the time and resources needed to bring all the groups together to work together in the way you wanted and needed them to? Yeah, um, and I'll say when we look at, looked at that slide with all the circles, pretty much almost never did everybody meet all at once. Um, you know, we really had myself and um, a couple of people from the innovation lab and the little rascals <laughs> as the driving group. Um, and we would sort of all peel off and meet with different stakeholders and pull them back together. Um, you know, for instance, uh, our youth advisory board doesn't need to be at the table all the time, but they really need to be the table for when we developed the questionnaire that went to teens. So they're at the table at their phase. You know, legal has only had to come in once or twice and you kind of pull off the core group. So I think it's, you have to develop your nucleus and everybody else is, you know, like out in the protoplasm and different parts and you just need to know when to pull them in. Otherwise it's meeting overload um, and people burn out. I think also really using um, people's time wisely is critical. So the beauty of video conferencing is you can pull people together. Meeting should be a half hour and they should have an agenda and you should move through the agenda quickly. I think for too long, we're kind of like, let's have an hour meeting and talk about our feelings. You really have to focus um, because people don't have time. That's great and I completely agree. <laughs> you really need to maximize people's time because um, everyone has value. Um, another question, did the adolescent welcome letter deter any parents from bringing their teens to the clinic? Yeah, I think that's great and an important balancing measure to consider. You know, I talked a lot about innovation, but I didn't have time within the um, 25 minutes to really think about what we think about in the QI framework, which is the unintended negative consequences that come from rapid cycle innovation. Um, so far, you know, that's hard 
to measure. Um, so I think the only way we would be able to know about that is through anecdote. But I will say I recently presented to our parent and caregiver advisory board with um, example text messages for this idea that we would send a text to parents before the visit. And for the most part, you know, parents were like, absolutely, yes, do this. This is really important. We want positive framing about how this is important for our health. But we did have a parent who was like, look, if you sent this to me, I don't want to bring my kid in. I'm going to, you know, think about switching to another provider. I don't want to see that over text message. That should be a face to face conversation that a pediatrician has with um, the parents. And so I do think we have to recognize that there are going to be people for which this strategy um, lands the wrong way. And sometimes it's accepting what proportion of patients and parents you feel like you're going to get the benefit from and what's the acceptable negative balance that you take. But there's always going to be a negative balance there. Thanks. Um, and do you do the adolescents have unique access on the patient portal? Yeah, that's a great question. We have spent a ton of time, um, one of my colleagues has sort of been the lead on this and it's a full-time job for her. So yes, the way our patient portal works is that at 13, the teen gets their own access and the parent has separate access or proxy access. Um, so the parent can't see, um, visits, the parent can really um, just communicate with the provider and send messages, but they can't see lab results or any information for the patient over 13. Um, one of the biggest implementation challenges we had to all of this was the 21st Century Cures Act, which um, required greater transparency in the EHR. And so we also had to completely revise our EHR system so that we wouldn't release STI results, HIV results, that certain medications were blocked, that PrEP medications were blocked, that certain notes were blocked from release. And that's been, I think, a lot of the confidentiality issues has been the hardest lift of this work. Great to hear um, that they, uh, the access is limited. Um, from the parents. Um, Teo, you have a question? Yeah, Sarah, this is, I am so incredibly impressed. I've been working in the, in the Bronx in the school-based health system to promote the providers to get their patients to get tested. And it's quite a job. And the comprehensive approach that you, that you uh, presented today is really incredibly amazing. I'm, I'm really, I'm stunned. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, congratulations. It's really wonderful work. So I'm, I'm curious to hear whether there are plans for rollout, but I have one, one detailed question about um, the decision moment of testing only of that it's required only once for 13 year olds. Uh, that's the decision tree. Have you considered figuring out if there is a way to make that moment of their first test more appropriate to where they are in terms of their sexual development and of course you know you have to make all these decisions so you cannot do everything but i'm curious about that yeah so i think that's a great question and that's been one of the hardest things is figuring out mm. how hard you nudge and when you nudge so for everyone 13 and up, when the provider opens up a visit for them, they're going to see the HIV test order and the STI test order there. And that's what we consider our passive nudge. That's just like the, hey, you should probably do this. Mm -hmm. The active nudge is the um, alert that I showed. And I'll see if I can go back to that. But that fires actually every time a kid comes in for a well visit if they have ever had sex so if and, and that allows us we thought about doing this based on age and just sort of said well everybody needs to be tested but i think you know theo you know given your work it's so hard to get anyone tested and if we're pushing clinicians too hard for the kid who's not even having sex yet they're gonna get annoyed um, because one of the things we have to work with, again, balancing measure is alert fatigue, like having too many things pop up that you need to do. So even though the universal screener in my heart, it hurt a little bit to say, we're only gonna fire this for kids who are having sex. That was the decision we made, but it fires 
every well visit for kids who are having sex. And I think the second piece of this is figuring out, do we fire this at sick visits if they haven't been tested on time? Do mm. we fire this at sports physicals if they haven't been tested? Do we fire this when there's a recent STI test that's positive? So this is kind of the base that we're working with. And the hope is then to come up with more sophisticated logic for additional opportunities to nudge. Great. And, and, and roll out on a larger scale? Yeah. So right now, this is just usability testing. Our hope is to implement this at four what we consider our innovation sites first. And that's four practices in our network where they're kind of the ready for anything practices. Um, we Whether it's an asthma or an immunization or a nutrition screener, we always implement at these four practices first. That allows you to see, are there bugs we need mm -hmm. to work out? Um, from there, we're going to um, implement at four low screening practices and then be able to look from there and then hoping to submit um, some grant work to be able to do it across our system and potentially export it to other health systems that use the same EHR system. Really, really very impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Dale, for your question. Um, I think we may have time for one more if anyone has a final question for Dr. Wood. If not, uh, once again, thank you, Sarah. That was a really great presentation. And Bob, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you. And I agree, Sarah. That was really wonderful. It's a great body of work. And um, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, you, thank may have you. Some, you may have some follow up from some of us. <laughs> Okay, and, and now it's really great to be able to move on to our second presenter, and we're really happy to have um, Shohi with us today, um, who is, you know, very close and, and, and with us here at Columbia. So Dr. Chohi Schrader is a prevention scientist and also an NIH T32 postdoctoral research fellow here in the Global HIV Implementation Science Program at ICAP at Columbia University. She's also affiliated with our good colleague, Dr. Dustin Duncan Spatial Epidemiology Lab here at Columbia. Uh, her research explores how the intersection of implementation science and social networks impacts minority health and health disparities, such as health, HIV vulnerability, mental health, substance use disorder among sexual, gender, and racial ethnic minority communities. Um, clearly a very close, important topic to all of us. Thank you so much for being with us, Chohi, and it's uh, over to you. All right, thank you. Can everyone see my slides? Yes, awesome. that's great. great. Um, I'm super excited to be here today. And today I'd like to discuss how social networks can impact HIV prevention conversations and behaviors. Um, and this will essentially be a description or a summary of two sub studies of Dr. Dustin Duncan's N2 cohort study. So his neighborhoods and networks cohort study of black sexual minority men and transgender women. So I first wanna start off by giving a brief introduction to social network research and talk about some of the theories in social network research that really push forward this type of research. Um, the first study I'll discuss is the role of social norms in HIV prevention and drug use behaviors using N2 data. And then the second study will discuss the role of homophily in HIV prevention conversations um, using, again, N2 data. Um, and then I'll discuss the next steps of my research program and any future and some future research plans. Um, so as most folks here are social scientists, you already know that the um, among like within social science research, you look at the individual as a unit of analysis. And where a traditional social network or social science research explains an individual's characteristics as a function based on other characteristics, such as you know, drug use as a function of the experiences of trauma, social network research resorts to an individual's social environment for these explanations. So now we're not looking at drug use as a function of trauma, we're looking at drug use as a function of the presence of a drug user within a network. It's looking at the relationship of that person and per people within their social networks, or perhaps even other types of networks that they may be in, um, included in, such as venues. Um, and so in social network analyses, we look at the relationship or what we call the tie or the edge as a unit of analysis. 
And social network analysis focuses on the role of social relationships in disseminating and accessing information, channeling personal or media influence, and enabling attitudinal or behavioral change with the emphasis on the relationship. And there are two types of social networks that I have previously worked with um, extensively, well, maybe not extensively, but somewhat. Um, the first type is what we call a social metric network. And this is a closed network. You can think of um, like a classroom or perhaps all of us on this call. There's this uh, high chance that we will know each other within this group. And in the social metric study, we would ask all of us questions about everybody else in this group and our relationship with other folks within this group right now. Um, you can imagine just how intense this type of data collection process can be, but this does give us very structurally robust data and provides very structurally robust networks. And so this type of research is really great for looking at groups of friends, um, education, peer pressure, or social norms. The type of research that I'll be describing today is what we call egocentric network research. And these are what we think of as the personal networks. So in this type of research, uh, one ego or the participant reports information about all of the individuals within a specific type of network or among different networks. And so in this situation, we say that we call these folks that the ego um, provides information about the alter. And this is great for collecting network information at a low cost, as this type of information can be quite difficult to obtain. Um, unfortunately, there are some biases using this type of method, as people tend to estimate network behaviors to be similar to their own. However, this type of research is quite powerful and gives us a glimpse of an individual social networks, such as their confidant networks, such as their sexual networks, or even their drug use networks. So the type of research that I'll be discussing today are going to be one mode research or one mode networks in which the ties are between one type of entity among individuals. Um, the ties that I will discuss today are going to be directed because they are going to be individuals reporting about their social networks, but they've been analyzed as undirected um, because we do not have bi-directional data. We don't know what the altar says about the ego. And we can also look at different types of valued or weighted ties. So we can look at, you know, on, um, asking questions such as on a scale of one to five, one being not very close, five being very close, how close are you to X? We can ask questions such as how often do you talk about HIV or STI prevention conversations? Um, also in social network research, we can look at different types of binary relationships. Is this person your friend? Yes or no. Is this person a family member? Yes or no. There are five-ish theories which have really guided my research, uh, the first of which is a the theory of homophily, and I'm sure folks know me, they've probably heard me say the word homophily in as many conversations as I can squeeze it into, um, or we can also call this social selection. So uh, in accordance with the theory of homophily, which is really developed by McPherson in 2001 in his paper, Birds of a Feather Flock Together, um, individuals are more likely to interact with others similar to themselves in characteristics, behaviors, and attitudes. Um, and this theory is a, quite similar to what we call the social influence or the differential association theory in which individuals learn behaviors from others and then over time become more similar to people within their network. So this theory was borrowed from the field of criminology, which wanted to look at deviants within networks. How does someone learn to become deviant? Well, in this situation, we want to know how do people learn different behaviors? How do they learn new information. What is it about these networks that causes them to uptake the behaviors that other folks within the networks do? Um, my research also uh, borrows from Rogers' uh, Diffusion of Innovations, which has really been developed by Tom Valente at the University of um, Southern California, in which examines a process by which an innovation or HIV prevention information, such as information surrounding PrEP or ART, is communicated through certain channels over time among the members of a social system. And we can often think about information and innovations in a network like a social contagion. So we're looking at how phenomena spread across ties. And an important function or an important theory within social network research is this theory of the strength of weak ties, um, in which individuals will often receive innovations from their weakest ties. And so I know this is a lot of theoretical um, frameworks to throw at you, but it's just something that I wanted to kind of get going um, before giving this presentation. Um, so in accordance with the diffusion of innovation, social contagion, and threshold theories, um, not only can individuals diffuse information, but behaviors can also spread as that social contagion. And so perhaps there is a threshold among individuals that has to be reached for individuals to uptake that behavior, to uptake that attitude, or to 
uptake um, any kind of innovation. And here I'm using the term innovation, um, but and essentially I mean any kind of like HIV prevention innovation. So this could be like PrEP, ART, using condoms, um, any kind of HIV prevention um, strategy, essentially. Um, so if I can just guide your gaze to the diagram on the right, you can see that Tom Valente has posited that individuals may have varying thresholds. For example, the ego on the left has only one person, the blue A, that has adopted this, in, this intervention before the ego themselves decided to uptake this intervention. Whereas the ego on the right is what we would call the high threshold adopter. They required three people, so 75% of their network, to uptake this innovation before they themselves decided to uptake this innovation. So I would first like to explore this um, network threshold or you know, social norm in um, a sub-analysis of Dr. Dustin Duncan and John Schneider's uh, research project or R01 funded project, the N2 cohort study. Um, and this study was actually accepted at the, or this as a manuscript was accepted at the archives of sexual behavior last week. And this paper is titled, the latent profile patterns of network level sexual norms and associations with individual level sexual behaviors among black sexual or gender minorities assigned male at birth. And I think um, we may have slightly edited that title. Um, and this again came from Dr. Dustin Duncan, John Schneider's um, N2 study. And additional information about this study can be found in the protocol paper that was published in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health Research titled The Social Context of HIV Prevention and Care Among Black Men Who Have Sex with Men in Three U.S. Cities and Neighborhoods and Networks Cohort Study. So as I'm sure most folks in the HIV Center are already familiar with, um, there is a lifetime prevalence of estimated prevalence of one in 257 white heterosexual men being diagnosed with HIV in their lifetime. However, this rate or this uh, prevalence is one in two for black sexual minority men. And a recent CDC study alarmingly found recently, I think in 2021, that three in five black transgender women are estimated to be living with HIV. This is alarming. This is a health disparity. And this is being addressed currently by a number of researchers throughout um, the US, including Dustin Duncan and John Schneider. Um, we have had PrEP since 2012, and we know that PrEP can decrease HIV transmission by up to 99%. And despite PrEP being available in the US for the past 10 years, gaps still continue to persist in access. Uh, just a year ago, we had injectable PrEP that was approved by the FDA for use as well, and yet we still experience these gaps in access. So until we can reach health equity in PrEP implementation, PrEP uptake, and PrEP access, researchers have um, a responsibility to investigate how to reduce HIV vulnerability from sexual behaviors. And so this study um, focuses on two specific types of HIV vulnerability, group sex, and the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex. And this research looks at how social norms can influence individual level um, HIV sexual vulnerability. So previous studies by John Schneider found that Black sexual minority men with a greater proportion of family members in their social networks were more likely to discourage group sex and drug use during sex. And however, black sexual minority men who had what we call an enabler in their social networks for group sex or drug use during sex were more likely to engage in that behavior. And this is um, can be attributable to social norms. And social norms essentially um, are the uh, beliefs within an individual social environment. And there are two types of social norms that we have, or we have decided as the research community that there are two types of social norms. We have injunctive sexual norms and uh, descriptive, I'm sorry, we have injunctive norms and descriptive norms. So injunctive norms are these perceptions of what is susceptible by others. And descriptive norms are the actual observed behaviors within a network. So the objective of this study was to use a person-centered approach, essentially latent profile analyses, to determine if there are different profiles of injunctive sexual norms. So do black sexual gender minority network members approve of the individual engaging in condomless sex, group sex, or the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex? 
and also descriptive sexual norms. So do Black sexual gender minority network members themselves engage in condomless sex, group sex, or the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex within the social networks of um, Black sexual gender minorities? And the second aim was then to identify associations of network norm profi profiles and individual level sexual behaviors with high HIV vulnerability. And the two behaviors that we wanted to examine were group sex and the use of drugs or alcohol to examine sex. Um, data from for this uh, analyses were taken from the N2 cohort study, which is a longitudinal study of Black sexual minority men and transgender women. And these data were collected from January 2018 to 2019 in Chicago using peer referral sampling at a federally qualified health center. Uh, essentially, participants, once enrolled into the study, filled out an individual level questionnaire in addition to an egocentric inventory. And the egocentric inventory ask participants to name up to five confidants. So confidants are, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, it, um, people to whom secrets are entrusted. So these are individuals that are the absolute closest, these are um, members of an individual's network that they feel very close to. Um, and then we then calculated the proportion of social networks that engaged in um, that behavior or approved of a participant engaging in their behavior. So then we were able to identify the different injunctive norms and the descriptive norm. So did alters approve of the individual engaging in condomless sex, group sex, or the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex? And did the alter also engage in these different behaviors? So we use a tidy LPA package on our environment to examine two to six latent profiles using indices such as the BIC, AIC, entropy, the BLRT probability minimum, probability maximum, and observing the sample size of each profile. We identified the model, which was the closest fit to our data. Um, once we did that, we looked at, or we conducted a binomial, a series of binomial logistic regression models to examine the associations of profile membership and the outcome of engaging in group sex or the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex. So we decided upon looking at those two to uh, six profiles to use the five profile latent class model. This model had the lowest BIC, it had the lowest AIC, it had the highest entropy, and it had a sample of over 25 members as suggested by previous literature. Um, our participants fell into five, or were categorized into five different profiles. We had who we call the low HIV vulnerability group. And this group had low injunctive and descriptive norms of um, HIV sexual norms. And then we have the moderately high HIV vulnerability group. So for this group, participants had um, a moderate amount of HIV vulnerability social norms within their networks, with the exception of the approval of the participant having group sex, which had a norm, which had about 0.75 um, proportion of their network engaging in that behavior. We then had the high HIV vulnerability group um, because this group had high descriptive norms of condomless sex. So almost their entire networks were engaging in condomless sex. And there was also high injunctive norm for the participant being um, having approval to use drugs or alcohol to enhance sex. We then had who we call the approval of drugs to enhance sex group, um, in which the injective and descriptive norms were low with the exception of this final group. And then we had the condomless sex group in which condomless sex was high and approved by the network, whereas the rest of the um, injective and descriptive behaviors were low. So once we were able to categorize or classify our participants into different profiles, um, we could then describe our, our participants. So our participants were a mean of 26 years old and were 87% cisgender men um, and 13.1% transgender women or non-binary identified. 85% of participants uh, participated in, or reported having condomless sex and 46% reported having group sex and 58% use drugs to enhance sex. So there are no um, main statistical significantly, or significantly different, oh my word, sorry. <laughs> there are no statistically significant differences among the profiles in regards to demographic behaviors 
Um, however, when it came to our outcome behavior, such as having group sex or the use of drugs and having sex, there were differences among our profile groups. And the results of our binomial regression models examining group sex suggests that um, not being in a relationship, having a higher proportion of the network that the participant had that sex with, having a higher number of sexual partners in the past six months, and having um, exchange or sold sex for money, food, drugs, or shelter in the past six months were statistically significantly associated with group sex. And among the different latent groups, we found that all groups with, um, relative to the low HIV vulnerability group, with the exception of the approval of drugs in hand sex group, were statistically significantly associated with group sex. Um, we found a similar uh, result for the outcome of the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex. So for this analysis, we found that having a higher proportion of network that the participant had sex with, exchanging or selling sex for money, drugs, food, or shelter in the past six months, in addition to the three profiles of the approval of drugs to enhance sex, having a moderately high HIV vulnerability network, and having a high HIV vulnerability network relative to having a low HIV vulnerability network were statistically significantly um, and positively associated with the use of drugs or alcohol to enhance sex. So this suggests that there could be some kind of threshold in which participants may have, um, sorry, a, um, a, a, I'm sorry, so part, there may be a threshold within participants' social networks that once this behavior or this injunctive norm or this descriptive norm has been accepted within the network, then perhaps a participant or, you know, Black sexual minority men, transgender women will then uptake, uphold, or I'm sorry, uptake this behavior uh, themselves. So um, this suggests that HIV prevention interventions must be designed to change social network norms until PrEP and ART can be equitable. And it's also really important that um, we do not stigmatize behaviors as, and in addition, network interventions can surmount structural inequalities, but they don't necessarily solve structural issues. So they are somewhat of just a band aid. Um, so fortunately, we have great researchers like Dr. Wood out there doing this type of really important implementation science work. Okay, and so the second study that I'd like to discuss is the um, relational attributes and the association and examining the association of relational attributes with conversations around HIV and STI prevention among black sexual minority men and transgender women. So we know that HIV status neutral care is an opportunity to understand gaps in HIV prevention using a stigma free approach. And the goal of the HIV status neutral care approach is to have a negligible risk of transmitting or acquiring HIV. So essentially people enter this cascade with an HIV test and they either progress along to the treatment and engagement core or um, branch if they test positive for HIV. And if they test negative for HIV, the goal is to get them into the prevention and engagement branch. Um, so once individuals learn of their status and they become aware of their potential care plans and then engage in a decision-making process about PrEP or ART uptake, and then it ideally adhere to this care plan. Um, previous studies have found that social networks have the opportunity to facilitate PrEP and ART awareness and promote PrEP and ART adherence. So network interventions such as Project Engage has been shown to diffuse PrEP uptake behavior. So networks can support HIV-related status-neutral care plan adherence. And so Project Engage, uh, which is, I believe the PI was Alita Boris and John Schneider, um, looked at how uh, young Black sexual minority men who tested positive for HIV could have ART adherence, um, and they use different confidant members within the network to assist that person to stay engaged in care. So the findings of this project were that young Black sexual minority men with a confidant who supported their HIV care were three times more likely to have at least three HIV care provider visits. And the confidant relationships that were more likely to um, be responsive to intervention related calls, including included mothers, and then female family members, and then friends. So while it's important to look at the um, inclusion of confidants, it's also important to examine that relationship type. Who are these people in your networks that are going to help you or help participants stay adherent to their meds, to get connected to meds, and to engage in care? 
Previous studies have found that hearing about PrEP from a friend or a doctor may increase uptake relative to social media, but it's unknown what confidant attributes are associated with these ongoing conversations about the prevention of HIV or STIs. PrEP uptake is not a simple behavior. It's not a COVID shot. Well, I guess now with injectable PrEP, it can be seen as somewhat of a more simple behavior, but it's complex. It's, it's previously for the past 10 years, it's been a pill that you have to take every day with ARTs. These are medications that you have to take that can have quite um, adverse side effects for some folks. Um, so to understand what confidant attributes are associated with ongoing preventions of uh, ongoing conversations about the prevention of HIV or STIs, it's important to look at these different social network theories, such as homophily and the strength of weak ties. So the aim of this study was to identify if homophily and tie strength is associated with the frequency of conversations about HIV and STI prevention among Black sexual minority men and transgender women. So for this study, we used a slightly different analytical approach, well, slightly different, yes. We use a multi-level uh, regression model, and we wanted to look at the different, um, or we wanted to look at the influence of HIV prevention, or the, I'm sorry, we wanted to look at the different relational attributes. Um, we want to look, so the type of ties that were present within each participant's network. And then we also want to look at their, um, the, characteristics of the confidants in their network. So what types of relationships they are, in addition to homophily on different types of um, attributes. So at level two, at the participant level, we examine age, sexual identity, housing stability, employment status, education, income. And we, do, we did look at the lab confirmed HIV zero status. Um, and viral suppression in addition to current PrEP use, but we present our data in a status neutral way. So we don't look at the number of people who tested positive or negative. We just look at, are you on ART? Are you on PrEP? Because essentially that's really what's important. Um, and then at the confidant level, we looked at participant or at participants confidants age, their racial identity, um, their ethnic identity, um, their gender and their HIV zero status. We also looked at measures of homophily. So, we looked at whether or not confidants were the same age as participants, older or younger. And then we also looked at whether or not confidants were homophilous with the participant on race. Are they both black? We also look at gender. Are they both cisgender? Are they both transgender? Or do they not share the same gender identity? Uh, we also looked at relational measures such as re um, relationship type. Is this your friend? Is this your best friend? Is this your family member? a sexual partner, or another relationship type, like a therapist, an HIV testing counselor, a neighbor, a boss, a colleague. We also measured closeness, the frequency of communication, and the frequency of the participant talking about their sex life with the confidant. So these last three variables are what we call the tie strength, and they're variables that we can use to measure just how close participants are with their alters. So we use a multi-level analysis using the Hawks buildup model for this um, analysis. So we looked at the unadjusted regression model. We then specified an intercept only model and then introduced a lower level than the higher level measures. And we used the LME4 package on R to conduct this analysis. And we did not test for any random effects, nor did we include any potential cross-level interactions because we did not have any a priori um, thoughts to these. So for this study, we had a total of 367 participants who provided information of 977 confidants. There were a total of 412 participants in the overall study who provided information about 1,028 confidants, but we did not have complete data for everyone. Um, some participants may choose not to share information about their social networks because they're not sure of perhaps the researcher's intentions, perhaps they could be isolated and do not have extensive social networks, um, among other reasons. So participants were in this um, sub-analysis were a mean age of 26 years, again, cis men, uh, gay, homosexual, lesbian, basically monosexual, same gender attracted, um, majority were stably housed in the past year, were high school educated, and made an income of less than um, 20,000 in the past year. And about 40% of our participants were either using PrEP or virally suppressed. This is kind of an overwhelming network visualization, but essentially this is what an egocentric network visualization looks like. The node color describes whether this is a participant or a confidant. Part white 
The white color indicates that the participant is not using PrEP or is not virally suppressed. The black color suggests that participants are using PrEP or virally suppressed, and light blue indicates that that person is a confidant. The node shape also indicates a type of relationship that is that the participant reported. So the gentle roundish squares are the participants, but then the circles are family member confidants, and the diamonds are another type of confidant. The size of the node also indicates the age. So smaller nodes indicate that the confidant is younger. Larger nodes indicate that the confidant is older. And the tight thickness also examines our outcome variable of the frequency of HIV or STI conversations. And you can see that thicker ties mean that there are more conversations being had. The findings of our analysis were a bit overwhelming as we had included many variables as um, we had a, um, a large sample size. So I decided to just, you know, boil it down into this little uh, forest plot. So our forest plot shows that there were six significantly, um, statistically significant associations of the frequency of HIV and STI prevention conversations among Black sexual minority men and transgender women, non-binary people, and their confidant networks. Um, we found that participants who are not employed and alters who were older were significantly and negatively associated with HIV prevention conversations. However, um, family members and stronger ties measured by closeness, communication, and sex life conversations were found to be positively and significantly associated with HIV and STI prevention conversations. Um, I just wanted to show a snippet of the network. So on the right, you see one, two, three, four different egos. About half are using uh, PrEP or virally suppressed, and the other two are not. Um, and you can see in this top network that this person had very thin ties, indicating they had fewer conversations of HIV and STI prevention with their network members. And these network members were also, uh, three of them were family members who were younger. Um, however, if you look at um, the uh, network at the way bottom with this black square in the center, we can see that two of those um, members of that person's network are um, were family members and two were another type of relationship and that this person had more frequent HIV STI conversations with two people, one of whom was a family member and one of whom was not and all four of whom were younger than the participant. So this suggests that Black sexual minority men and transgender women are less likely to discuss HIV and STI prevention with confidants who are older than them. Um, there could be some kind of fear of judgment that's happening here. Um, and so this suggests that peer or, or there could be some kind of fear of judgment that's happening. And actually, when I did a, a dive into the literature surrounding different cultural values surrounding respect, I didn't really find that much um, that had been done with uh, Black folks in the US, African-American folks. Um, there was extensive research done with Latino uh, and Latinx uh, people who live in the US, but this also signifies a gap in the research and perhaps there could be um, more information that looks at this. There is quite an extensive amount of information available on the role that the church plays and the positive benefits of the church. However, um, our participants may be less likely to discuss these um, discuss HIV and STI prevention with the confidants who are older than them due to that fear of judgment. So uh, peer or network-based interventions can consider matching participants on age with peer intervention staff to ensure they feel comfortable. We also found that strong relationships facilitated conversations surrounding HIV and STI prevention and future network interventions can consider promoting stronger ties. So network interventions that include manipulation of the network can enhance closeness through increasing contact, through um, introducing like scripts or conversations in group settings um, around maybe like talking about sex life, talking about other things to facilitate closeness. And our study really showed the positive benefits of family members on HIV outcomes. Um, previous research has focused on the negative aspects of family on HIV outcomes. So this could be suggesting that the pendulum could be swinging, times could be changing. You know, Biden did just sign in that Marriage Equality Act not too long ago, which is amazing. So maybe we are becoming a little more welcoming and open to LGBTQIA plus people in the US. Um, especially among Black families, but 
this might not be what we necessarily see from you know the recent attacks on um you know the drag storytelling so yeah um okay so there were some limitations in our study uh we used peer referral sampling which could have introduced some dependencies within our data and participants may have also been present in other participants social networks but we weren't able to accurately capture that although red driver and i are working on a paper to look at this um data were self-reported by participants and we did we um, did note several times, or I noted several times in the presentation that there may have been a false consensus effect. Um, and additionally, we didn't really have any rich or nuanced descriptions of the different experiences of transgender participants in our analyses um, because we did group together women, trans feminine people, and non binary people in the same group, although we recognize that these folks have very different experiences. So, overall, take home messages. Um, Black sexual minority men and transgender women are more likely to engage in group sex and sex drug use if their injunctive and descriptive network norms had higher gradients of condomless sex, group sex, or sex drug use. Social norms are an important convention in individual level decision making. And family members, age of confidants, and tie strength are important for talking about HIV and STI prevention. Um, so there could be a power in family based interventions, and there could be opportunities to change social norms. So going forward with the study, I hope to look at different network dynamics um, and perhaps look at, at what talking about HIV and STI prevention interventions can do to increase the use of biomedical strategies. Um, I'm really interested in looking at how HIV innovations can flow within um, society or within specific networks, and also looking at the spread of novel biomedical drug use. Um, and I'm really curious, or really interested in somehow merging the field of implementation science with network interventions. And currently, I'm doing this on a very, very, very small level with my um, CEDAR pilot, um, with the which is looking at the sociometric networks of Black, Latinx, and sexual and Caribbean sexual minority men and transgender women in New York City. Um, and with that, I would like to also state that I am on the job market, and I am very excited to share my research with other folks. And I hope that you were entertained during today's presentation. And please feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in any future collaborations. And I just want to thank my mentors, Dustin. John, Danny, and Justin, the Spatial Epi Lab, the HIV Center, Tao. Oh my gosh, Stephen, I should have put your name on there too, but I'm also thankful to you. I would also like to thank my um, Global HIV Implementation Science Group, Andrea, Marianne, and Yale, including the fellows, and the High IRI Institute at Washington University of St. Louis, the participants in our study, and the audience. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. That was really fascinating work. I'm glad you were able to share that with us. Um, a reminder uh, for before we jump into the Q&A portion, uh, if you have a question for Dr. Schrader, you can post it in the chat. I'll read it out on your behalf or the Q&A feature, or you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. So first, let's jump to Cersei. She has a question for you. Cersei, you should go ahead and unmute yourself. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yes, I, I really enjoyed um, your talk today and um, I very much enjoyed your presentation. And I was just wondering um, your, your research, uh, I was wondering if it took into account or how it might take into account sort of external forces and their impact on gentrification, such as um, public housing assignments, um, or ex external forces on social networks, I should say, such as um, gentrification or public housing assignments, um, shutdown of meeting spaces, such as that during happened during COVID-19, um, and how that impacted things like, you know, engagement or makeup or effects on um, social networks and their impact on, on health. So yeah, thank you for your question. I mean, I'm, there's just been so much that's happening with um, community-based organizations that's been ongoing since even before the COVID-19 pandemic. I don't know if you've heard of like the merge, grow, or grow, um, like I guess kind of like an epidemic where a lot of CBOs are being forced to either shut mm -hmm. down, get bought out by larger CBOs like AHF, and kind of like lose their community um, individuality. Um, and I would say that this research 
this data that I presented to you was shown pre-COVID. Um, mm -hmm. So I would be also really interested to see how COVID could have uh, changed these networks. And this is definitely something that I'll bring up with my mentor, um, Dustin Duncan, and also John Schneider to see what we can look at. We do plan on looking at changes in network structure. We're going to look at um, the changes in uh, different risk behaviors. We do collect data on housing instability. So we ask participants, did you experience any homelessness in the past six months? So we are able to identify that. We don't ask any questions on gentrification. Um, however, this is something that we could explore in a future uh, qualitative study. But I think those that that's a really, really great question. And oh. I think that definitely we could use more research on that. And it's interesting too, because social network research can be used to surmount these bigger structural barriers. But what happens when these um, structural barriers actually dissolve social networks or change them or fragment them or isolate people or create new networks that may lead folks to have more harmful behaviors and stray away from more um, healthy, more healthy-ish behavior. So yeah, thank you for your suggestion. I'll definitely look into that. I'm sorry, I didn't really answer your question, but that's no. a really great research yeah. idea. <laughs> no, you did. And um, I was also thinking just in terms of um, gentrification and its disruption of public spaces, but even like public housing assignments where if someone is being like, you know, they get a place to live, but they're like taken away from their social network and how that might impact. But um, just really excited about the work you're doing. It, it was amazing. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Cersei, for your question. Uh, we have a couple more. Uh, can you give more details on how you ascertain and distinguish injunctive versus descriptive norms? Sure. Yeah. So for this study, we um, we looked at injunctive norms as being did this network member approve of you engaging and um, approve of you engaging in a specific risk behavior? So we asked participants, hey, did this person that you name approve of you? Does this person approve of you having condomless sex? Do they approve of you engaging in group sex? Do they approve of you using drugs or alcohol to enhance sex? And then we asked participants, does this participant, does, or, I'm sorry, does this alter engage in condomless sex? And the participants had the option to reply, yes, no, or I don't know. Um, does this participant, or does this alter engage in group sex? So the difference is that we're looking in injective norms at whether or not they approve of a behavior versus descriptive norm as to whether they actually engage in that behavior themselves. So it's kind of this thought of, you know, when folks can say, um, act as I do, not as I say, is that, is that the quote? Um, but yeah, so we, we wanted to differentiate between like our participants doing these things because the people are doing these things or is it because people and their networks are approving of them doing this thing or perhaps it's both. And we found that it's a little bit of both. Thanks. And the second question, can you say more about the role of the church and social networks? Have you found positive or negative effects? Sure. So I don't necessarily look at churches in my own research, but from what I've seen in other studies, so I used to work for community-based organization in the Bay Area. Um, so I'll speak to my experiences while working for that community-based organization called the AIDS Project East Bay. And we worked mainly, or APEP, we worked mainly with um, Black sexual minority men, transgender women in Oakland, California. And we found that although like faith-based institutions could be really powerful in um, disseminating and providing HIV prevention interventions, for example, our clinic was located out of a church that was super gender inclusive um, and super like just so warm and welcoming to all folks that there could be some churches or some structures that may be less welcoming of folks um, and different religious subsects that could be a little less welcoming of folks from the LGBTQIA plus community. I think Gina Wingood actually has adapted um, her intervention to be implemented with different faith-based institutions. Her intervention, I think, is called Sistas, but she worked with a, a huge mega church in Atlanta, and she found that this church was able to um, host these HIV prevention um, intervention, like group sessions for uh, Black women. And so the church could easily be um, a place of solace where it could be really um, an opportunity to intervene and to 
provide more HIV, to be a place to provide HIV prevention interventions, but it could also be a place where folks feel stigmatized and feel shame and they're rejected due to the church leadership. So it really depends on the church um, itself as well as an individual's experiences with the church because um, I think Dr. Wood was saying that implicit biases could be manual, malleable. So there's a chance that, you know, churches could change, you know, times might be changing. We might be having um, like less LGBTQIA plus related stigma, um, less intersectional stigma, um, but we're just not entirely um, sure yet. Although the HRC, I think in their state inequality index recently found that inequality is decreasing, but I'm not sure. I, I'm not totally sure. I'll look into that. Thank you. Thanks. And before we wrap up, I'm going to let Justin expand on a comment he made in the chat. Justin, you can unmute. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, I just wanted to elaborate. We, we definitely, um, I'm Justin Knox. I'm one of the MPIs on one of the uh, R01s that's funding the um, uh, continuation of the N2 study that, that Chovy's working with. And we have included um, a gentrification scale in the upcoming or in the ongoing, the current wave of data collection in N2. And it's definitely, uh, you know, something that we think is important and a topic that we're interested in. There's also, you know, other potential, you know, um, ways that we could get at this construct. Um, you know, I think Chovy mentioned, but um, men would carry uh, GIS devices with them for two weeks after the in-person assessment. And we do know if they've um, moved recently. So it could be, you know, men who moved in the past few years and, and are, you know, commuting longer or are moving more in general, you know, could maybe be uh, indicative of, 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 you know, being impacted by gentrification. Um, and I know John Schneider in particular is interested in the area. Um, him and one of his mentees uh, published a paper in um, Lancet HIV called The Last Black Man Living with HIV in San Francisco, kind of talking about how gentrification has been an overlooked um, factor in terms of uh, you know, impacting the HIV epidemic and the need for more research in that area, um, particularly in empirical research. So I, we think it's an important topic and, and do have plans to focus on it moving forward. Agreed. Thanks so much, Justin, for sharing that. Um, so we're close to time. Uh, so we'll wrap up the Q&A. Once again, thank you so much, Cho. That was a great presentation. Uh, Bob, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Cho. Thank you, Sarah. Both really, really, really great presentations. We're honored to have you both here. So um, yeah, thank you all for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, rounds event on January 12th. Um, we wish everyone happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas, winter solstice, whatever you may celebrate. Um, hoping that you all have some good and relaxed times over the next few weeks with friends and family. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. So take care, everyone. Be well. And um, happy holidays to all. Bye-bye.